Creativity in the Age of COVID with Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. It's the only program in which therapy and entertainment come together to show everyone not only how to cope in the age of COVID, but how to be creatively productive through it all. And now, Dr. Judy Bloom and Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, Judy. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Richard? I'm doing great. It's so good to see you. So I want to know what's been going on since we last saw each other. Well, it's actually, it's been a little um, on the chillier side where I am here in Florida. For us, you know. <laughs> Come to New York. <laughs> hey, gets down to 60 degrees here. You know, we're putting on the snowsuits, right? <laughs> well, we're expecting a nor'easter this weekend. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, but, you know, as I do with my uh, name, Richard Skipper Celebrates, what are you celebrating besides the cold weather? Um, uh, I'm celebrating my marriage on Sunday. So. Well, I'm so sorry that I won't be able to be there. But as you know, uh, our kitchen is being renovated and uh, the cabinets are coming tomorrow, God willing, uh, yes. before <laughs> the Nor'easter comes in. Uh, so at least we got our stove back in, but we're waiting for the new stove to come which won't get here until March because everything's on delay. So as you know, this new game that somebody sent me, Be uh -huh. Best, and I'm pulling uh -huh. a random question to ask you to okay. start okay. off. I haven't uh -huh. seen the question. And it's the what's, what's the one thing that you did that you wish that you could go back and undo? I like that. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, when I was still... Uh, in, in my previous lifetime, when I was doing television news, right? Um, when I was pregnant uh, with my daughter, Heather, my first pregnancy, um, I wound up deciding at that point to stop doing TV news, okay? In order, in order to become mm -hmm. a, parent, a, a better parent. That was a good choice. But I got hoodwinked <laughs> into working for somebody doing a, doing a promo spot for somebody, a video for somebody who turned out not to be an ethical person. Wow. Right. In this now, business? <laughs> <laughs> we could do a whole show on that. On that. And that's what, that's a regret that I had anything to do with that, that very unethical person, you know, um, fortunately I got myself out of it, but you know, it, it taught me a lesson to really investigate anybody you, you do any kind of work for or with that you really you need to know who they are, you know. Absolutely. Well, I've been down that path. And, you know, that's very interesting because I think, you know, I pulled that question randomly. Today, as I said before we start our show, uh, today is all about female power because we have three very powerful women who are creating uh, through COVID and uh, they've all uh, had very successful careers. Uh, some of them have had to uh, pause for a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. but that didn't stop them. And they are back on track. Uh, they are creating and forging through where we're going right now. Uh, I'm going to start with our first guest today. Uh, Karen Ertrovich has kept uh, Jane Austen alive and well. I'm gonna show a little clip of her at work, brilliant actress that she is. And then we will see her on the other side of this clip that we're gonna show. And here she is with The Dream. The grove was gloomy all around, murmuring the streams did pass, where fond Astraea laid her down upon a bed of grass. I slept and saw a piteous sight. Cupid a weeping lay, till both his little stars of light had wept themselves away. Methought I asked him why he cried, my pity led me on. All sighing, the sad boy replied, Alas, I am undone. As I beneath yon myrtles lay, down by Diana's springs, a mintus stole my bow away and pinioned both my wings. <gasps> Alas, cried I, twas then thy darts wherewith he wounded me. Thou mighty deity of hearts, 
he stole his power from thee. Revenge thee, if a god thou be, upon the amorous swain. I'll set thy wings at liberty, and thou shalt fly again. And for this service, on my part, all I implore of thee is that thou wilt wound a mintus heart, and make him die for me. The silken fetters I untied, and the gay wings displayed, which gently fanned, he mounts and cried, Farewell, fond, easy maid. At this I blushed and angry grew, I should a god believe, and waking found my dream too true. Alas, I was a slave. Great work. Good. Hello, Karen. Welcome to our show. First of all, I'm going to ask you the same question. Has there ever been anything in your career, we'll, we'll stick to career, not life choices, that you've done that you wish that you could go back and redo? Oh, thank you, Richard. First of all, it's an honor to be here. And second of all, you know that that was Afra Ben yes. and not Jane Austen. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, uh, and what have I done that I, if I wish I, if I could go back and, um, do something else, I, I think it would be, um, that, um, sometimes I will, uh, uh, I have committed to, to, uh, a couple of, of, of companies, theater companies, and, uh, and then stayed with them longer than I needed to. Uh, but this was very early on in my career. And, um, you know, it's hard to multitask when you're doing life, right? You know, you're doing your job, you're doing your auditions, you're doing this and that. And so, you know, if one company cast you and then you just stick with them and you stop auditioning, I, I kind of wish that I had that I had auditioned more. Okay. Well, I want to ask you, we've all gone through this collective pause together. Yes. Uh, where were you uh, when everything started to shut down in the industry? Uh, and what did your calendar look like as everything started to shut down? And how did this affect you both psychologically, which Dr. Bloom will address in a moment, uh, and uh, work-wise, how did this affect you? Well, believe it or not, I was actually doing Cheer from Chawton, a Jane Austen family theatrical at the 14th Street Y mm. as part of a Women's History Month event, ev event with Risharda Abrams and Jenny Lynn Bader. Mm. And we had each of us a solo show. We were performing there. We promoted it. Um, you know, I remember um, going into it, uh, watching on the news. Uh, you know, they mentioned COVID something, this thing. And, you know, we all thought it was going to be confined to that one army ship that where there were people. Uh, we thought it was going to be a confined thing, you know, Legionnaires disease, cruise ships, you know, that sort of thing. And we just forged ahead, you know, and um, it was crazy because um, my Jane Austen show, I, uh, you know, my shows have evolved. So I'm, it's interactive. I, I, you know, I go and shake hands with the audience as Miss Bates. I play Miss Bates. I shake hands. I, I touch people. I bring them up. I have my niece. I talk to her on stage. I have all these you know, ways that I make contact with people because I found this was the way to make Jane Austen come alive. I didn't want her to be separate from people. I wanted her to be with her family. So then, you know, as we're getting these reports, we're thinking, oh my God, I can't touch people anymore. How do I, you know, do I beckon them to come onto stage? And then how do I deal with the guy that I dance with? You know, I mean, it was a whole slew of things. Well, some very brave people did come to our shows and we performed right up to the minute when they closed Broadway. And then we were called and said by the 14th Street Y, you know, we, we're closing, you know, we can't, you know, go on. It'll be a couple weeks, ladies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, 
and of course it wasn't just a couple of weeks and um it was a, a shocker you know i mean okay we were closing and and we understood it and and i understood because i was shaking hands with people but at the same time we're we're all there going broadway's closing yeah. broadway mm -hmm. broadway never closes mm -hmm. you know i attended broadway right after 911 you know everybody got those great tickets right after 911 remember oh yeah we could all go you know for 25 bucks you know <laughs> Broadway was closing and that was that was quite something I think for all of us. Oh. Judy, do you have any comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering as the weeks went on and you realized that this was not going to be over quickly. How you adapted at that point. First, how you adapted, you know, personally as well as professionally. Well, as the weeks first of all there were very practical matters to take up uh take care of you know uh i brought my props and costume home with me uh, a few weeks later we went in to pick up the rest of our our the things that were left at the theater uh and very fortunately at the same time i am an artistic associate with the first flight theater company and our, our artistic director, Frank Farrell, wanted to start reading plays on Zoom. You know, everybody started talking about Zoom and could we read plays on there? And 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 we thought, well, why wouldn't we do that? Let's let's get busy. And um, Frank is like the Energizer Bunny. And I, I think we read, you know, 12, something like 12 or 14 plays over the summer. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the exact number. And then in the fall, you know, he wanted to um, make arrangements for us to do these readings live and benefit other organizations. And I volunteered to direct the first uh, public reading of Letter to Jackie by Maxwell Anderson. Uh, part of First, first Flight's mission is to do um, plays by Maxwell. And it's, it's like plays by Maxwell Anderson and other unknown writers. They're not known now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we got busy with that. And then from that moment on, you know, we just all had lots of ideas for plays. We produced that whole month. I got to perform all these different characters. I just kept buying wigs and that was really fun because zoom is so much fun. You, you do your collar, right? Richard, you, you do your collar and then you put your wig on and <laughs> you know it's the 17th century or it's you know it, it's the 18th century or it's um you know i mean world war ii I, I don't know you can just do anything it's really it's really kind of fun you can use your imagination and uh, so then in the springs a couple of things i'm really proud of is i directed a a, a vampire kiss in the plague of 1666 we did a zoomy of it we got we went to the union we got a micro budget agreement and we filmed this little uh, radio play. It was supposed to be on the radio. Uh, we filmed this radio play by Jim Fitzmorris mm -hmm. on Zoom. And it was right in my realm because it takes place in the modern times and in the 17th century. Uh, Sam Peeps was a character. Robert Boyle was a character. Margaret Cavendish was a character. I knew all these people. So I am like, this is so cool. I'm going to direct this on this little zoomy and then the zoomy got submitted to festivals by our playwright by professor fitzmorris and we were at this point we've been in or gotten awards in 35 different film festivals internationally wow which you would never i mean i i'm just do theater you know i'm just a you know a, a, a theater maker that you know i i can't say i'm a, a big star or anything but this but you're getting seen by a bigger audience than you would have seen yeah. otherwise by this. So, uh, you know, COVID has had its pluses. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then I directed one other thing called The Whitlings by Fanny Burney, who is a, a novelist who lived in the 18th century. And that play, you know, we're on Zoom. We got reviewed. So I got a review for First Flight. I got I got to work on this play that I've been dying to work on that never I don't know if it would get done in on a stage because, 
you know, women playwrights aren't normally produced. So there I was directing The Whitlings by Fanny Burney and got a review on the, by the British Society for 18th Century Studies. That's wonderful. Yeah. I want to bring on our next guest. Um, Therese Lee um, has written this, an amazing story, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her show. I'm going to show a clip from her show uh, called Riding the Bus to the Red Carpet. Uh, that title tells you a lot, but we'll see a little bit of this, and then we'll meet Therese Lee on the other side. And here it is. If you knew my story, you'd have a hard time believing me. You'd think I was lying. So tonight is about the absurdity of life's grand cosmic karmic design. How in one of the most unlikely and unique twists of fate, one soul at her lowest could be thrust nose first into rarefied air and given one, possibly her last, shiny brass ring of ridiculousness and hope. You're alive, so come on and show it. You've got a lot of living to do, Therese Lee, with real Hollywood. He touched me. <laughs> he put his hand in mine, and then he touched me. I felt a sudden tingle when he touched me. A sparkle. A glow till you're at the end, the end of your rope. Till you're standing in my shoes. I don't want to hear nothing from you, from you, from you, because you don't know. I finish the song which I oversell. Somebody says thanks and wishes me well. The next thing I know, I'm at Taco Bell, stuffing my face with meat. She's I've never, never been, been one for flipping, flipping my lip, but, but I gotta tell you that flip it, I did. did. High no, life has stepped into She's my certainly not a gal who is hot to be left at. Anymore. And I met Jane Fonda, John Malkovich, Taylor Lautner, met Judy Dench, met Matt Dillon, all over Stone, Florence Henderson, Tommy Hilfiger, J.K. Simmons, Chris Christopherson, Alex Borstein on the other side of the tracks. If you knew my story. And she's going to be riding that bus right to New York. And that's she's coming to New York in April with this show. Therese, welcome to our show. And I'm going to start with the same question for you. What's the one thing that if you could go back that you would redo in your career? I was thinking, I knew you were going to ask me that. So I was thinking, I was thinking, Get ready, like, Quinn. It's coming up. <laughs> the thing that comes to my mind and... Um, there was a time when I, it's like 25 years ago, I was, a friend of mine died of AIDS and I just decided that life was too short and, and I'd always wanted to go to England. And so I went and I studied acting at this school in the summer that was at Oxford, British American Drama Academy. And then the next year I went to the Royal National Theater Studio and I studied acting there. And the teachers were all, you know, telling me whatever you do, you should do this. You were born to do this. And I came home and I went, I should get a job. And I put my head down and I let, and I didn't believe it. You know, I didn't believe what they were telling me. And I feel like, and I, and honestly, there were some things I had to work through that I probably wasn't ready. But um, I regret that I just cared more about what other people thought because I had a, people, you know, I felt a lot of judgment about the life that I wanted to live, and I wasn't being responsible, and I was in debt, and all this stuff, and. Um, and I regret that I didn't believe what those people were telling me in England, 
uh, mm -hmm. because I could have had 25 more years of the happiness that I feel now. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. Obviously, you worked on the red carpet. I did. Uh, what you were a publicist? What exactly were you doing on the red carpet? You were in Hollywood. Um, you and I have a friend in common, Harlan Bowl, uh, who is a well-known publicist in Hollywood. Uh, so you were hobnobbing with the stars. Yes. Uh, so you are, what exactly were you doing on the red carpet? And where is that taking you to where you are right now? Well, I worked for this little company called Man Made Multimedia, and they did this tiny little show. And actually, they hired me to do marketing for them. And then one night, NYPD Blue was having their uh, their a rap party, and he didn't have any reporters to send out. And so my boss said to me, you want to go to the red carpet and interview the people at NYPD Blue? And I was like, sure. So he said, I'll, he said, I'll pay you 25 bucks an hour and go. And, and I couldn't... So I went and it is the headiest feeling to have access like that. You, you're talking to people that you've watched on television and movies for years. And not only do you get to do this and talk to people you admire, they pay you to do it, you know? And, and, and so it was, um, so that became a part of my job because, because of my acting and singing background. And, and I watched a lot of television, to be perfectly honest with you, and saw a lot of movies. I, I just had this instinctive ability to talk to people. Um, and, you know, like sometimes I would, I remember I interviewed Michael Chiklis at an event and um, I had seen, I was in New York when he was doing his one man show called Caveman. And so when we were on the red carpet, I said, I remember when you were in New York at doing Caveman and he almost fainted because nobody in LA knows that stuff, you know, that nor do they care really. So it um incredible mm -hmm. an incredible job. What what do you think that you learned from that one night that you were first of all thrust into an experience that you had never done before? Uh obviously you said that you felt that you were prepared based on your knowledge of having probably fantasized about doing something like this, but having all of a sudden being thrust into a world that you had never truly experienced before. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I felt like, oh God, I felt like this was my world. And, um, and I just, I, I loved being around the people that were doing what I wanted to do. And I know from personal experience with some other things that, you know, if you want what people have, you have to do what they did. And so the opportunity to um, not take it from them, but just learn from them, uh, to talk to people. And also for me in my life, I've been through some pretty tough things. And um, and I always thought that if I got famous, that would fix it. And what I've realized is that fame does not fix anything and it doesn't make somebody a nice person. It in fact, I think it exacerbates people's problems. Uh, if you have a problem, it makes it just that much more magnified. That's been my, so I just learned not just that first night, but over the course of my uh, working that job that this was not what I thought it was, you know, which was a blessing for me, honestly, to realize that, mm -hmm. but not to chase it anymore. Judy, any questions, comments? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you kind of came to grips with the reality versus the fantasy, right? And I think that that's something that's true for a lot of people. You know, they have this fantasy of what something is going to be, is going to be including even, you know, relationships and whatnot. You know, people enter in, into this fantasy about them. Um, and then the reality, you know, comes along and they're shocked, you know, that the reality and the fantasy don't quite line up. Um, so it's interesting the way, you know, the way that you experienced that and reframed it. And then it sounds like, you know, took that to rework your own life into something that does work for you, that, you know, that works much better than the fantasy. Now, Therese, did you have any aspirations to be an entertainer prior to this? Or uh, were these experiences that you had doing this uh, become the catalyst for what, uh, wanting to put your story on stage? No, I, I studied um, 
I started singing when I was 14 and I studied a uh, class. I, I wanted to do musical theater. That's another regret. And my parents really, because they were paying for college, they wanted me to study opera. And so that's what I ended up doing, um, which is a great education. And I did mm -hmm. art song recitals and things like that for a long time. Um, but then when I was 29, I don't know what it is about that age, but um, I stopped drinking and, um, and I realized that it was my life and I get to, uh, I get to do what I want. And I started taking uh, coaching with Karen Morrow and that sort wow. of wow. changed my life. But, um, but then I, I never, uh, you know, there were just some things that came up that I had to, I had to deal with that, um, that kind of put my life on hold, uh, except for dealing with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that all the performance and stuff went by the wayside. In fact, I stopped singing altogether because I think singing, you have to you have to be receptive and open and feel. And the last thing I wanted to do in that in that period of time was be open and feel. And mm -hmm. so I I I feel sad that I lost a lot of years, but it was necessary to rebuild from the bottom up. That was uh, my my journey. <laughs> But it's been worth it. I'm here to say that it's worth it. Good for you. Now, I'm going to ask a question for purely selfish reasons, uh, because you had mentioned earlier that on the red carpet, you met a dear friend of mine, and that was Carol Channing. Her birthday is on Monday, and I'm celebrating her Monday night on my own uh, show. But um, you said that she changed your life in a significant way. Can you elaborate on that? And then we'll bring Quinn on. Okay. Um, yeah. Just quickly, I, I tell the story of my show that I had uh, uh, had a car accident, which is when I lost my car, and I had been uh, had also lost the marketing part of that job, and so I didn't have any money. I couldn't replace my car, and so about two months, I was taking the bus around Los Angeles, which, if you know LA at all, is not a great thing to have to no. do. Yes. And so I went to this uh, premiere of this movie called Gotta Dance, which was a documentary, uh, and Carol was there, Carol Channing, and um, so I got to interview her afterwards, and the movie's about senior citizens who become members of a hip hop squad for the New Jersey Nets, and they find this whole career. And so she was there, and I got to interview her backstage, and I, for some reason, I don't know what, I was really depressed, I just turned 47, now that sounds really young, and I said to her, this movie gives me hope because, you know, I'm 47. I've never been married. I'm struggling financially. I don't know what I'm doing telling Carol Channing this stuff on the red carpet. I'm supposed to be interviewing her. And she looked at me so kindly and she said, 47. I'm 88. I, <laughs> I just married the love of my life. Um. And then to be Hedron walked by and she goes, she's depressed about being 47. And they both started laughing. And I went, I think the universe is trying to tell me something. <laughs> and then after she had done all her other interviews, she was leaving and she came up to me and she said, I really enjoyed our talk. And I just, the, she, that kindness and that message from Carol Channing, like it, you're alive, go for it, you know? <laughs> really. I just had to share that because I love her. I always love her for oh, that. Oh, that's wonderful. And I love Quinn Limley. Uh, Quinn and I have known each other uh, for uh, longer than Quinn's been on this planet, I think. Uh, we have, we've known each other. We go way, way back. Uh, we have uh, done shows together. We've done benefits together. Uh, Quinn has, uh, she is probably one of the hardest working women I know. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she is uh, has uh, an incredible show uh, celebrating um Rita Hayworth, uh, and I really want her to talk about uh, this show because it's not just the surface of Rita Hayworth, the goddess on stage, but she goes deep into the levels of uh, her battles with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and uh, who this woman was uh, beyond the goddess. Uh, I'm going to show uh, a clip, and I chose this clip because it shares the experiences of the audiences. Uh, who come to see uh, Quinn, and we will see Quinn on the other side of this. Here it is. I Quinn is Rita. It, it is amazing. It was so emotional. I laughed. I cried. Quinn 
Ben is reader, only even better. You want to cry at the end, and yet she picks you up and says, look at all that she did. She's her own hero. Quite terrific. She was more than great. It wasn't just her singing, which is like, mwah. The acting that goes with the singing, the meaning that she took forward, that you really got a sense of what this woman's life was. Quinn Lemley is a force of nature. And Quinn, uh, getting a little bit of feedback uh, here, Quinn. So make sure that nothing else is open up. Uh, nothing, uh, you know, no other, uh, no other computers or anything around you or anything. We're getting just a little bit of feedback. Uh, everyone else may need to mute while uh, Quinn on here for a moment. I don't know why, but we're getting a little feedback here. Uh, but Quinn, um, you have this show back after a while. I want to begin by asking you the same question. I asked everyone else, if you could go back, is there anything that you've done uh, that you uh, wish that you could go back and undo in your career? Is there, yes, there is, Richard. I, I think I'm getting a feedback, but I'll just keep talking. Hoping no, no, that we're not getting good. feedback now. Okay, great. Um, I was doing a show off 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 Broadway. I, it was Siren Songs of the Silver Screen, and I was at Theater East, and it was a an extended run. I think we played for like ten months, and we were doing five shows a week. And I was invited to sing for the the Indian for the the, the symphony in Indianapolis, and I was going to be a guest artist. And it was the winter, and I was so nervous and I got my charts together. All I had to do was sing like four songs. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I mean, I prepared, I was ready and we had a snowstorm and I, I went, was at LaGuardia and I was waiting and waiting. And I, two days later, I had my show back in New York and um, you know, granted the, the flights were grounded and I couldn't go. And the show was the show was the next day. And I regret that I didn't just rent a car and go because I've never had a chance to sing with the symphony orchestra. And that would have been the, the gateway to something. And now touring as much as I do with all of our rock and roll shows and, and my shows and the companies, you know, a symphony orchestra, it's a company and we do whatever we need to do to get to wherever we need to be, because it takes a village to, you know, to put on a show. And it's mm -hmm. not just the performer or the musicians, it's the marketing, uh, you know, Teresa. Um, it, it's, it's everything. There were so many people and I was early and too young in my career to say, okay, it's 12 hours or 13 hours. I'll just, get in the car and go and I'll drive and uh, and then I'll do the show and then I'll drive back and do and be on stage in New York in time. And I, I really regret that because I've never had the opportunity to sing for a, a, a symphony orchestra again. And that is a dream of mine. And um, I sometimes I wonder if my fear was so great that I manifested this. No, I don't know. But, you know, I, I was paralyzed about it because it was mm -hmm. such a big opportunity. And then Mother Nature got in the way, but I didn't find a way to, to make it happen, which I would never do today. And I want to say to everyone who is muted right now, if you feel that you want to weigh in or anything, unmute yourself and jump into the conversation. Uh, but Quinn, uh, how long have you been doing The Heat Is On? Uh, I know it's been uh, it's been years, but you've decided now to bring the show back. Uh, mm -hmm. You are now in residence at Don't Tell Mama. Uh, yes. It's been a while since, uh, I, but you brought it back and you've expanded the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've brought it to a new level. What is different about doing the show now than it was when you first started doing the show? Well, Dr. Bloom, I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> I have life's experience. <laughs> no, you know, we, I, I was in my 20s when uh, we started doing the show, and it was a, a very different show than what it is now, musically, dramatically, and storytelling wise. And, you know, 
I was where I was when, when, when I started and I was more in love with the glamour and the, the, the pre pretense of it. You guys were talking about the red carpet and, and who these people, the surface of who people were. And then I met my husband, my manager, Paul Horton, and he completely changed the show. And Carter Inski, um, who's my writer director, we really started mining other deeper stories. And we also opened up the music from her films to the fabric of her life. So it opened up musically and we put it to a 12, uh, 12 piece big band, but at Mama's we're doing it with a quartet. So mm -hmm. we couldn't fit all those people, but I did fit the big band at 54 below. And I'll tell you, there was no room to go move. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, during, so I had been so busy directing and producing the past four and a half years. And, and, and I was doing another show called burlesque to Broadway, which is all about the power of women. Mm -hmm. And, um, I hadn't done Rita for a while. And so with COVID, I, you know, it was weird. I hadn't performed on stage for two years with COVID. And I was really nervous. And, and my husband, we were doing big performing arts centers and casinos. And he said, why don't you call Sydney Meyer and go back to where you began your career? And in, in the club that you started. And so, of course, you know, I was thinking, I'll just do a jazz set, you know, it'll be easy. And he's like, darling, it's been so <laughs> long since you've done Rita and you need to introduce them, introduce her story to the new women. And so it just so happened that Carter during COVID rewrote the entire book. So you can imagine, Richard, relearning every one of your lines in a different way and telling things in a different story. It was kind of crazy, but it was wonderful. We incorporated the Me Too movement. Um, we we really soft up her dialogue because she Rita Glenn Ford said she had a mouth like a sailor, and so you know it, it's we really created it so that we broke. We always broke the fourth wall, but this time it was just really Karen. You know, like really getting emotional and touching that audience. You know, and it's it's we just go there now, like the heartbreak that she felt with, with Orson Welles and, and trying to, to make fantasy life with a Prince Ali Khan. She was the first princess and just, you know, and being a mother and then dealing with the alcoholism, um, you know, congratulations, Therese. And um, she, you know, just, and then they also, you know, the, the tragedy was everyone thought it was alcoholism, not, um, Alzheimer's. And I remember very vividly um, because I was that kid that read the fan magazines. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the headlines of her getting off of a plane and mm -hmm. those pictures of her where she was being accused of being an alcoholic mm -hmm. when it was the early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, she was scheduled and you can, you know, talk more about this. Uh, mm -hmm. She was supposed to come into applause on mm -hmm. Broadway mm -hmm. and she was having trouble remembering her lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in the newspapers that mm -hmm. she was uh, having trouble remembering her lines. And the press was uh, nasty to her, uh, mm -hmm. not knowing what was really going on. And of course, we didn't have a name for it then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what have you learned about yourself uh, from uh, delving into those areas that are so dark um, uh, that a lot of people are still, I think we've gotten more where people are talking about it, mm -hmm. but people are still, it, it's still an area where people still don't know a lot about. What have you learned about this? Well, I mean, Rita Hayworth was the first celebrity to be I, I I don't know how to say it, but but it came out that she had Alzheimer's that that was announced Prince and it was because of her strength and foresight as a mother and as a woman when she was divorcing Ali Khan that she fought for the equal inher uh, inheritance uh, as the as the boys mm -hmm. and 
that was Rita Hayworth. A lot of people don't think of her as her strength. She had her own production company in in the end. I mean, she she tried to do everything that she could as if things were unraveling, but she was really a, a powerful woman in her own soft, fiery Latina way. Um, but all, the Alzheimer's, you know, they do that Alzheimer's Foundation every every year. And it was Princess Yasmin who took care of her at the end. And she actually became the head of, of the Alzheimer's Foundation and really put a light on awareness of that. But I, I have to say, I mean, there were so many issues that we deal with in this play. It's, you know, a, it's not a sad play, even though we go deep in the, in the issues, it's a celebration of this woman's strength, her power, her beauty, the gifts that she gave to the world and her creativity in a time where you had to play the game. I, there was a series on Marilyn Monroe on CNN and, you know, she, Marilyn Monroe came out and said, look, you know, there are a million girls that are willing to play the game. And I deal with that in mm -hmm. our show too, uh, when she lost her role uh, for Daryl Zanuck fired her because she wouldn't play the game with him. Mm. And not that she didn't play the game, she did, but <laughs> she wanted to choose who she right. played with. So, um, you know, there, there, were, there were just so many aspects of, of, of female empowerment in this play. And, and Carter really, we, we delve down deep into it, but it's told with such humor and pathos and self-respect, uh, re self-reflection, -re um, mm -hmm. you know, and he and I have just really getting, preparing for our opening in September, just being together. It, it, it was like therapy in a way, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, theater is, you know, but Oh, I, wish I should say this line. Or, oh, that's what that means. And a, a lot of things, Richard, you know, things of there's no way I could have understood at 20 that mm -hmm. I understand now that we are an indiscriminate age of fabulousness and je ne sais quoi. We've yeah. known each other for a very long time. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Before we were born. Yes, before we were born, I think lifetimes ago. Yes. Uh, Smitty, do you want to weigh in on anything that uh, Quinn has said? Because I've got some questions that I want to ask our other guests here. Yeah, no, I, 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 Quinn, I think that, you know, there has to be a difference for you as a performer when you're performing a character who you obviously really love mm -hmm. as a person. You really love this person, right? Mm -hmm. Versus playing a character who you may not like, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you're an actor, you play, play all kinds of characters, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I I'm wondering for you personally how it how that resonates with you how that how how you deal with that difference with the, those you love and those you really don't like. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it's delicious to play, you know, really hateful characters. Look at Lady Gaga in in, in the Gucci film. Oh, she's divine. Yeah. And <laughs> um, you know that, that I love playing those kinds of roles, but Rita is really a kindred soul for me and mm -hmm. I you know, I don't feel that. I feel like I'm channeling. I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not acting, and I feel that she's with me. And if I have to ad lib or whatever, I just, I just feel really present. And I, I'm so. I just know her story so well. But, but the biggest thing that Carter and I, our journey was who was Margarita, Margarita Cancino and who was Rita Hayworth and her whole thing was that they went to bed with Gilda and woke up with me, mm -hmm. but we're all Margarita Cancino. We're all that little girl or little boy that wants to be loved and mm -hmm. wants people to approve of us. And the Rita Hayworth character, the glamour, the untouchable love goddess where the, she was on the first, um, star, her poster, her pinup was on the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. uh, the last atomic bomb. And that was really a source of uh, angst for her. But, and they called her, you know, la vedette atomique. And, and that was written, she hated war. So, uh, you know, that image just kept being used. So for me, I, I, I just, I, I love the character. I like, I love the good and the bad and the ugly of her, you know, I mean, it's just all delicious. And, and the other thing that was really fun was we decided that we were going to show it and embrace it. And, Thanks. and because of it, we've gotten rave reviews and we just got extended through June 23rd, you know, Congratulations. 
Yeah. So, I mean, and New York One did a big piece on us last month. And so it, it's, it must be re re resonating because, I mean, a lot of women are coming to out and, you know, saying, oh, my God, I relate to this. And, and also we deal with, um, you know, the sexual abuse she had with her father and first husband. So, um, you know, you, you hear people go, oh, I don't want to go there. And we're like, don't worry. I'm not going to, you know, mm -hmm. going to paint a picture for you. Wow. Good for you. What, what was your Shark Tank thing? I saw that you were a finalist oh, on Shark Tank. Yes. So during, well, we we had um, we had started this one show that R Richard knows about, and then um, we it turned into Burlesque to Broadway, which is my show that celebrates the icons that went from Burlesque to Broadway and beyond, and um, and it, it it was a wonderful show, but it was during the height of the recession. And we, there were so many things that we wanted to do with it. And so I'm a Toastmaster and, and we auditioned for Shark Tank and then we got called back and called back. And then we were supposed to be on for season five. And we spent six months with the, with the producers because you have to do all your financials, your historicals, your what you want to do. And I just... <laughs> And so, so a I Shark Tank it. calling you now. Yeah, Shark Tank's calling me. I know they're calling Dr. Blue. Yeah. So, okay. so anyway, um, we were, it's a reality show. So they keep you off kilter. And uh, so you're just, you're told like within three days, you have to go to LA and do your, your, your thing. And we've worked on our pitch and everything. And I had my neighbor who she does statistics and I'm not very good at Excel. And I said, would you look at my formulas? And so, and so I had to tell her what I was doing. And she said, oh, well, um, if the sharks don't bite, I would love to invest in your show. And so the next day the, the shark, the producers called and said that they're not, they're not investing in, in the entertainment uh, se sector this season. And so then I got my, I got my full investment. I got that. We got the best partner ever because she's to totally opposite me. She's brainy and smart and numbers oriented. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just like, Oh, I want to be fabulous and, and glamorous. I, and, and she was just the perfect partner for us in the show. Just, it just took off and we, went all over Canada and North America and casinos and performing arts centers. So it was great, great. with feathers and sequins and fans. <laughs> great. Um, I have a question for each or other guest uh, and I will start with you, Karen. Uh, so make sure that you're unmuted, but I want to ask you in terms of your work um, and, and Quinn, you may want to mute yourself um, for the moment, um, but Karen, uh, how you feel that your work has impacted your life beyond the stage and how you feel that your life has brought life to the work that you do on stage? Uh, well, I think it, it, you know, when you're, when you're a theater artist, you know, you kind of have to go by your instincts too. You know, there's something telling you, you gotta, you gotta do this. And I've always felt that way uh, since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that I was raised by uh, a painter and a choreographer. Mm. And, um, and my father was a painter and he passed away in 2011. And at that, you know, he never let me work with him about his paintings. And I was busy with my career acting. And so... Anyway, uh, once he passed away, though, I I felt his art should be seen. And, you know, you'd think, well, Karen's stopping acting and, you know, that that one doesn't have anything to do with the other. But it really does. I, you know, uh, I had to study his paintings more. I've archived all his paintings. That's why it says I'm an archivist now, you know, when you looked me up on LinkedIn and and all that. And uh, I've done so much work uh, with that work that, but it enriches everything else I do. It enriches my acting. It makes me think visually of my characters when I created a character. Um, and the dancing side too. I mean, I, I take ballroom dance probably because of my parents, both dancing. And no, I'm not ready to be on Dancing with the Stars or anything like that. However, 
you know, when I was working on the character of Gertrude for Hudson Warehouse, I, uh, I, I learned a, a samba that I, I did at our, our little recital, our little recital, our ballroom blitz. I, it was, it informed Gertrude, you know, so mm -hmm. there is art and life enter, intertwining there, the things you do privately and the things you do publicly, and it all feeds, uh, it feeds you as an artist. And Teresa, I want to ask you the same question. How does how does the how do you feel that the work that you've done on stage has impacted your life beyond the stage, and how you feel that your life has impacted the work that you do on stage? This this particular show that I'm doing now has been incredibly healing for me. Um, I talk about some things um, that are scary for me to talk about, but um, it has been really healing. And there have been women who come up to me afterwards and say, thank you for talking about that. You know, like they wait till the very end and then, you know, I'm a assault survivor. And so um, I always think like I'm getting too intense, but it's my life, you know, so to be able to like incorporate all of this and use it for um, someone to, to, to share my experience, strength, and hope in a way that will help someone else to show that um, it, I, you know, it's been wonderful to do the show. And then those moments when those both times, I've only done it twice, but both times the women have come up to me at the very last and said, thank you for sharing that because I'm a survivor too. And it just like, and then I just go, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing this. And, and so it gives it a higher purpose than just my ego, which I, I think is really, um, it's been incredibly healing. It's, uh, and I'm so grateful. I'm grateful because Jeff, I just wanted to say like at the beginning of COVID, we had just started talking about this in December of 2019. We had sort of come up with this idea. And then when the pandemic hit, Jeff said to me, we have the gift of time. And it really has been a gift in this crazy way. It's been one of the best things that ever happened to me. So anyway. Great. Great. Uh, Quinn, uh, I want to ask, uh, and then I'm going to ask each of you this question as we begin to wrap up. What are, what do you think is the biggest lesson that you've learned about yourself uh, during COVID as far as your creativity is concerned that you think that you will carry forward beyond COVID as we come through this pandemic, hopefully very soon? Yes. Thank you. That's a great question, Richard. Um, my resourcefulness. I, I, there's always a way to do and learn anything. If, if you, if you're open to it and the universe does provide, my mother always says that, you know, but you have to trust and be willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. And for when Broadway was closed down uh, in New York, um, I remember that day very well, Karen. We went to, my husband and I were celebrating our first wedding anniversary in, in Maroma, Mexico. And we had our little dog, Zoe, and we went there. And then everything closed down the next day when we got there. And so we're at the resort where we got married, this fabulous five-star resort. And all like all the resorts started closing down and it was all like Brits and C Canadians and Europeans and Mexicans and, and Americans. And we wound up being the only people there for three months with our dog and another couple, Vinny and Nancy. And I filmed it. I filmed every aspect of like the 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 exodus of all the people, the fear, like there was no COVID there. So, and so anyway, when I came back to New York, it was um, Manhattan Neighborhood Network is a, is a, a cable network for um, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful uh, resource for people. And they had these online premiere classes and I became obsessed with learn I learning how to edit. And I started and I started filming and I made a documentary. It took me six months to edit it. Paul and I had so much fit footage of all the food and, and like <laughs> it was just interesting because nature was encroaching. And I just started 
um, making these documentaries and they air the first Sunday of every month at 7.30 on oh, MNN. Wow. And like I, my, my musical director, voice teacher, he and his husband and his dog, Oscar Hammerstein and Paul and, and we, we and our dog Zoe, they were, we were bubbled together. So we spent Thanksgiving and we, we, like I filmed everything, like how to shop and, and the drama of it and standing out at line at fairway and, and Citarella for two hours to get in line, you know, because we had this social distance and then how you cook. And they were the first people we had in our house and opening the window. I mean, it was just like this whole thing. And so I did it. I did a, a documentary on that. And then also we, um, during the election, we were so worried because the lines were so long for voting and people were stopping voting. And so Paul and I produced a show called Broadway on the Line, and we hired 36 artists to entertain people in, to stay in the line to vote. We didn't care if they wow. who they voted for, but and we paid them and we and we had stilt walkers and singers and Good you know musicians. You. So I've, I made a documentary of that too, because it was like, you know, get out the vote, Broadway, Broadway's on the line, because we were the industry that was hit the hardest and had the least help in the, in, you know, in, in the wow. beginning. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I, I, I felt like I was res resourceful and, and I learned to be um, creative in a different way. That's wonderful. Uh, Karen? There. Yes. Well, um, I, I, I have to agree with Quinn, uh, you know, you, you, you got to be creative in a different way and, um, you know, you, you just can't stop being an artist. Um, so I would say, uh, I mean, I don't want to be a copycat, but, but I, and I didn't do all those altruistic things, but, you know, I felt like I was part of something where we were doing readings, we were contributing money to charities, and I got a show up of my father's work uh, in a mid-sized museum, the Massillon Museum of Art, and people were helped by my father's work, seeing that work, that made me very happy to get that up. Uh, it was meaningful for my family, it was meaningful for my mother. We were in, um, Therese, we were in a full front collision over the summer, so I just am thankful for every day that I have. And, you know, uh, so COVID, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, you cope with it and uh, you do what work you can and you take care of your family and your loved ones and yourself. Absolutely. Uh, Therese. Um, this is going to sound weird, but, uh, you know, I had this little pet care business that I was doing before the COVID hit and I had all this work lined up. I had a lot. I loved taking care of animals. It's very healing, by the way. Um, but it all disappeared overnight. Everybody canceled. I had and I had nothing. I had no money. I had nothing saved. I had nothing. And I was like, OK, so here we go. And I'd been scraping by for many years and. I just had to surrender and then all that stimulus came and because I had my own little business I could apply for the SBA stimulus and all and it's and suddenly I had enough and what I realized is that when I had enough I had the energy to create because when I was scraping by every day just trying to survive and get everybody what they needed and pay the rent and do, there was no time or or energy to do anything else and in the last two years, I've actually had enough. I've had enough and a little bit extra to do things that make me happy. And I'm no, no longer willing to go back to that small existence that I had before. And that's been the gift for me of this period of time. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay, um, we're, at, we're gonna wrap up because we are at the end of our show. Uh, just to let you all know, I'm gonna have my final remarks and then Karen, then Therese and then Quinn, you've all got a chance to give your final remarks. And as always, uh, Judy, you've got the last word uh, today. Um, I wanna thank everybody who tuned in today. Um, and I'm going to start where we, uh, I'm gonna end where we started. Um, I pulled a question randomly. And the question is, what's the one thing that you did that you wish that you could go back and undo? Um, we aren't given a chance for redoing. So I'm thinking that 
uh, since we're not given that chance, um, let's just go for it. Uh, let's, you know, when that chance comes our way, um, who's to say, uh, I love what Therese said earlier on, that she wishes that she had not listened to those people who said, you can't do this. I grew up on a tobacco farm in South Carolina. A lot of my friends know my story. Uh, for the first 18 years of my life, everybody said, you can't go to New York. You can't do this. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. I didn't listen. <laughs> when I was 18 years old, uh, one of my favorite books is The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol. Uh, it says in the book, set your mind on a goal like a homing pigeon and go after it. And I announced to my family when I was 13 years old that five years from August 5th, 1974, I was going to come to New York. And I did. And I never looked back. And uh, and that's the way I live my life. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work out the way I planned, but I go for it. Um, I've learned a lot uh, this past year uh, and especially over the past few months. Uh, I don't know about you, but it seems like, especially this month of January, uh, it seems like every time I go on Facebook, uh, we're reading about another celebrity who has passed away. Bob Saget, uh, he one performance in the middle of a tour that he was supposed to, uh, that he was scheduled uh, to do, one performance and he's gone. Uh, so we're not promised tomorrow. I don't want this to sound morbid. That's not my intent. Uh, get out and do those things that matter to you. This is it. Do it, do it, do it. So get out, do the things that matter to you. Go for those things. Uh, who cares if someone's going to say no to you or someone's going to say you can't do it? That's their issue, not yours. So go out and do those things. I want to thank everybody who showed up today. If you enjoyed today's show, uh, please, if this is your first time, subscribe uh, to Richard Skipper's Celebrates. Leave a comment here on YouTube. Share this with your friends. You will see on the bottom of your screen, it says whatyoumeantome.com. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a wonderful guest on our show. He has this wonderful site. I would like all of you, I want all of you to nod your heads that you're going to go to this site and you're going to go to Facebook after this show is over and you're going to go to the ninth name. That's the number for today. The ninth friend on your friends list. And then you're going to go back to this site, whatyoumeantome.com, everybody who's watching, and you're going to go to your ninth friend and you're going to fill out the form and you're going to tell your ninth friend what they mean to you because we're not promised tomorrow. And you've got to let these people in our lives know what they mean to us. Uh, as our dear friend David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. This one. I love you all. And now, Karen, you've got the final word. Thank you. Just trust your instincts allow yourself to be an artist and um also uh stick with your family they it's not in the way it will enhance your art Teresa, it's worth it just keep moving forward process and go for it it's worth it Gwen? Um, my message is you never know who's sitting next to you that can help you on your journey. You just never know. Like my friend, the Toastmaster that changed my life. So you just keep going for it because you never know who you're going to meet along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to pick up on that as well on, on what Richard was talking about, because the difference between a dream and a goal is a plan, an actionable plan. So work backwards from where you want to wind up. Look a year ahead, two years ahead. As he said, it was five, I think he said five years ahead when he was a kid. And start breaking that down backwards into, into 
years, months, weeks, days, hours. Get it on the calendar. If you write it down on the calendar at a specific time, on a specific day, it's an appointment. It's an appointment with yourself. And that's the most important appointment that you're going to make that day. So really understanding it's non-negotiable. This is what matters to you. And that's all that really matters. And anybody who tells you that you can't do it, that's, you know, that's up to them. That's their problem. You know what you can accomplish if you put your mind to it. And that's how we live following two paths, looking forward while still living in the present. Just don't lose sight of your goals and, and your dream will eventually become your reality.